Hi, thank you for joining us for part one of the second session of our learning lab on coaching for practice change. Our focus for this session is on statewide implementation and systems considerations for implementing a coaching for practice change model statewide. We will be hearing from two states, Wisconsin and Minnesota, about how they developed or enhanced state infrastructure supports to facilitate coaching for practice change statewide. As a reminder, this first, the first session in the Learning Lab focuses on innovations for the delivery of coaching. You can find the links to the recorded presentations and supporting materials from part one and part two of session one on our website. Part one consists primarily of presenter information sharing and part two features our presenters answering questions submitted by participants. As we were planning this session, we thought about the forest and the trees and the root system of state infrastructure necessary to support implementation of evidence-based practices statewide. This led us to think about the roots as being foundational in terms of the supports and nutrients necessary for implementation. Margaret Wheatley talks about the example of the Aspens in Utah, the Pando clone. It is one of the world's oldest, largest organisms. A person might be in the midst of this enormous Aspen forest and think only about the trees, but underground, the root system is a cohesive mass. It is, it is essentially one tree that has spread by sending runners or producing additional trees covering over 106 acres. We encourage you to think of how your system might be similar to this natural phenomenon, where you start possibly with your initial trees or implementation sites and how you spread your roots or capacity to scale up practice-based coaching statewide. The ECTA system framework addresses the question, what does a state need to put into place in order to encourage, support, or require local implementation of effective practices? As we shift our focus to statewide implementation of practice-based coaching, it's important to think about these six components of a high quality Part C or 619 system and how they facilitate the effective implementation of a coaching for practice change model. The governance component must address the state leadership and coordination of the work, including the vision and mission, the key partners to involve, selection of the evidence-based practices to focus on, and the selection of implementation and demonstration sites. The fiscal component must include the identification of initial and ongoing funding for implementation and scale up of the initiative. The personnel workforce component must address the capacity of personnel needed for example, identifying personnel with training expertise, as well as those with skills in the area of coaching, the methods and expectations of personnel, and the resources that will be used, such as an online portal to house materials and resources to facilitate communication among participants. There are considerations regarding the data collection and management for both program and practice implementation. Decisions such as which measures to use, determining when fidelity has been reached, how to integrate quantitative and qualitative data, and who will be responsible for collecting data and generating reports are all critical to tracking progress of implementation. Related is the expectation that you develop a culture of data use at both the local and state levels of your system. For accountability and quality improvement, plans must be established for when and how both state leadership and local programs we we'll use results from the data, both qualitative and quantitative, for continuous improvement. Regarding quality standards, selection of the evidence-based practices and the expectations of practitioners should be aligned with program standards and what we expect children to know and do. There are also cross-cutting themes embedded in the system framework, which are foundational to which are foundational for work within each of the component areas as they relate to the implementation of practice-based coaching. Those include cross-sector collaboration with other early childhood systems, use of data, stakeholder engagement, effective communication, and family leadership. These considerations specific to system components are applicable to both the state and local level 
of program and practice implementation. As you listen to our guest speakers, I encourage you to be thinking about which components of your state system are strong and well poised to support a practice-based coaching model. Conversely, you may be thinking about the component or components within your system that may need more attention for you to be successful in your implementation. Remember, you can't simply focus on one component of your system because all components interconnect. We're talking about systems here, but you do have to start somewhere and then you essentially move out to interconnected components as you build your system capacity as a whole. I now pass it over to Mary, who will introduce our speakers for today. Thanks, Katie. We are very fortunate today to have two states represented to explore coaching for practice change through the lens of statewide implement implementation. We'll hear about their systems considerations and examples from their work. First, we'll hear from Wisconsin's Birth to Three program about their use of primary coach approach to teaming. We're joined by Terry Enters, Part C Supervisor and Coordinator, and Dana Romnery, one of the state leads for the Part C program. Our colleagues from Minnesota will be the second set of speakers. Hope Beisel and Sally Hansen are Regional Early Childhood Special Education Professional Development facilitators and Part C 619 representatives. They'll be sharing their story of implementing coaching as it relates to the pyramid model for social and emotional foundations of early learning. Wisconsin's Birth to Three program is focused on a primary coach approach to teaming. Terry and Dana, we're anxious to hear your state story and learn more about how you've built your state infrastructure for using coaching for practice change. Thank you, Mary. Um, the Birth to Three program is located in the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. We had a recent reorganization, and in January of 2017, the Birth of Three program became part of the Division of Medicaid Services, and we also are housed in the Bureau of Children's Long-Term Support. Our direct Birth of Three program staff include myself as the Part C coordinator and supervisor, and there are four state leads who provide both monitoring and general supervision responsibilities and also work on our policies and procedurals. In 2016, we hired a full-time data analysis who supports the program by gathering, interpreting, and visually representing data in a meaningful way for the Birth of Three program. The Department of Health Services then contracts with our 72 counties in Wisconsin to operationalize the Birth of Three program at that local community level. Each county then identifies a Birth of Three administrator and coordinator at the county level. Each county then can either provide direct services themselves or they can contract with a non-government agency to provide direct services to children and families. The counties are then divided into five regions in the state that are supported by either having that support regional dialogue and then also our monitoring assignments and our technical assistance areas. The Department of Health Services contracts with a Cooperative Educational Service Agency, or CESA-5, to provide technical assistance directly to the 72 counties. This has been a very long-term relationship and contract for more than 20 years. There are five regionally-based part-time staff and a supervisor. Then the department state leads and the resource staff work together as a team to provide both in monitoring and technical assistance and move across county programs with both compliance and implementation of evidence-based practices. The resource staff also act as our eyes and ears across the state as they live in the area that they provide technical assistance for. And this allows us really to having sharing of regional concerns, trends, and progress because of their close proximity to the counties. Thank you, Terry. Uh, let me give you some historical perspective of how we have ended up uh, where we are now through uh, both coaching practices and the use of implementation science. In 2010, Wisconsin began referencing and implementing uh, this evidence-based paradigm from Russian Sheldon's work 
that you see on the screen now, uh, shifting from a more a service-centered or therapy-driven approach to a relationship-based coaching approach in early intervention. So as a result, Wisconsin's professional development and techn technical assistance from resource staff also focused their efforts on the coaching aspects of intervention. Birth to Three program team members were learning how to share their expertise with families through the coaching practices in order to increase the family's confidence and competence to support their own child's needs. So as part of the January 2010 effort to shift practices towards an evidence-based, relationship-based approach, the Wisconsin Birth to Three program sponsored a statewide event to introduce the coaching and teaming approach to all county leadership in the state of Wisconsin. So following this 2010 statewide event um, to introduce evidence-based practices uh, to county leadership, county birth to three program teams were asked to self-identify whether or not they believed as a birth to three program team, they were quote, ready for initial implementation of the primary coach approach to teaming. Um, and at that point, we had 25 county birth to three program teams who stepped up and identified themselves as ready and who then returned in April of 2010 for a two day, two day institute with Dathan and uh, Dathan Rush and Melissa Sheldon. So then 2011, another 20 county birth to three programs did the same, stepped up, self-identified themselves as ready, and then attended a second two-day institute with Dathan and Melissa. Melissa. So in 2012, Wisconsin began um, to implement regionally based services or really region, regionally based uh, institutes rather than uh, with Rush and Sheldon, they became a single day uh, event with uh, our local experts from the UW-Madison Weissman Center and our five resource staff who um, also spent a full day with Rush and Sheldon uh, previously on how best to support County Birth Three program teams around coaching and teaming practices. Um, all Birth to Three program teams who participated in an institute, whether it was with, with Rush and Sheldon or was with the state Birth to Three program teams um, on a regional basis, they had to commit to the following four uh, objectives or items. First was to identify a full team as outlined in Rush and Sheldon's March 2007 characteristics of a primary coach approach to teaming. Second, every team member had to complete Rush and Sheldon's designed coaching logs. Every team had to participate and every member of that team had to participate in monthly conference calls with the resource staff to review, reflect, and discuss their completed coaching logs. And finally, participate in reflective feedback sessions with our resource staff. So in 2013, to keep the statewide installation of primary coach approach to teaming moving forward and to support the programs who did not participate in the uh, any of the previously sponsored institutes, um, we contracted with the University of Wisconsin Madison's Weissman Center to develop five web-based modules using and implementing uh, primary coach approach to teaming with one model in particular centered around implementing and sustaining effective coaching practices with families and birth to three program team members also learning how to uh, coach one another. So restore, resource staff to this day continues using coaching practices as an interaction style when providing all of their technical assistance support for pro, uh, county programs and including the annual improvement plan. Uh, more recently, coaching opportunities around program improvement strategies and improvement plans, resource has intentionally reached out to and included county leadership and administration, which I'll uh, make more reference to in the next slide. And it was uh, an important product, part of this process is reaching out to those other players in the Birth to Three program. 
So all these, although these recruitment efforts for leadership and administration is a relatively new uh, uh, reach out, program leadership who have participated are clearly showing their ability to take what they've learned from resource and those program leadership folks are using those skills and techniques with their own staff. So in 2013, again, as part of our state systemic improvement plan or the ESSIP, Wisconsin Birth to Three program began to fully appreciate and utilize implementation science. Um, we often kind of joke it would have been nice if we had been using this uh, the three or four years prior to that, but that's okay. We discovered it and started putting it to use. So after spending several years in the exploration and installation stage of primary coach approach to teaming and util utilizing coaching practices to support the competency driver, as you can see on this, um, on this, on the screen on the left hand side, we began to thoughtfully and intentionally think about the other two drivers, including organization and the leadership driver. We recognized and began to appreciate the importance and more importantly, the necessity to utilize all three drivers if we were to successfully implement and sustain these evidence-based practices around primary coach approach to teaming. It's interesting, similar aha moments occurred within uh, county birth to three program teams as they found themselves often stuck or unable to move forward with implementing uh, the primary coach approach to teaming. Our resource staff helped birth to three program uh, leadership recognize that in order to fully and successfully implement primary coach approach to teaming, it was necessary to incorporate all three foundational supports of this practice as seen on the previous slide. This was reminiscent of the state birth to three program recognizing each of the three drivers, competency, organization, and leadership must be considered and respected uh, for system change to occur and be sustained. So additionally, these three drivers may need to be revisited periodically when uh, system change gets stuck or finds itself sort of regressing backwards. Um, or, poss yeah, or possibly regressing. Each of the three legs of implementation science and primary coach approach to teaming must be embraced, practiced, and revisited in order to be effective and sustained. That's kind of the aha moment uh, that we've had with both of these uh, practices that if you don't do all three, um, you're not gonna be able to sustain um, this practice. And so, um, each of the three legs of implementation science and primary coach approach to teaming were embraced. And with this realization, we began restructuring our professional development system and moved away from high level statewide training and began utilizing our local uh, regionally based resource staff as external coaches. And they in turn could provide the support and TA directly at that local level. This resource uh, establishes early on with all birth to three programs a, uh, a, a trusting relationship and they live in the area in which they provide that support. They, they know the, the local folks and they just spend a lot of time working with the counties and additionally resources available to make sort of on-site visits uh, really at any moment. So, um, Resource began facilitating coaching practices with county birth to three program leadership. So capturing the leadership driver and supporting leadership with their own coaching practices with program staff. And this is similar to how birth to three program team members serve as primary coach, serve as a primary coach and work with a uh, family member to support their own child's growth and development. So the contract with resource in the state birth to three program was restructured so that additional time could be spent providing TA and coaching within their own local region. Um, the county program leadership with guidance and coaching from resource and the birth to three program state leads work to update uh, organizational infrastructure components, including contract changes to reflect evidence-based practice language and primary coach approach 
uh, to teaming language, such as coaching, teaming, uh, and, uh, and primary provider roles and responsibilities. Also bringing Berk to Three program fiscal conversations into the forefront, including reconciliation, billing, reviewing historical fiscal trends, developing questions, hypothesize, hypothesizing um, um, discussions with what are our trends, what's causing these trends, and being able to take that information back uh, to the leadership and the fiscal department uh, to take a deeper look as to try to explain some of our some of their trends. Um, so finally, as we develop our tool that we're developing um, to provide better and more accurate monitoring and supervision of county programs, we are being very intentional about addressing the implementation of evidence-based practice and primary coach approach uh, to teaming, but within the context of the three drivers to support a program identifying when things are moving forward and when things might be able, when things are regressing and being able to identify why that might be happening. So as Dana mentioned in 2013, when we were looking at our state systemic improvement plan, um, we created our, our theory of action during phase one. Um, we really started to really focus on Wisconsin identifying all three, all levels of system change that needed to occur to assure sustainability of evidence-based practices statewide. Um, in, in order to assure sustainability of evidence-based practices, it was really critical to understand that coaching practices needed to occur across multi-levels of our system delivery. S coaching needs to happen between our resource staff and county leadership, from county leadership to the practitioner, from practitioner to practitioner, and finally, from the practitioner to the family. The installation of reciprocal coaching practices throughout our continuum will sustain our opportunities to meet or even exceed our state identified measure result as referred as the SIMMER. So Wisconsin has had state initiatives to install and sustain coaching practices. In the beginning of installing, we created a Wisconsin question and answer document that answered specific Wisconsin questions around coaching and implementing evidence-based practices. We had monthly lunch and learn conference calls with resource with Russian and Sheldon. We designed regional mentors that were discipline specific to be available to support around coaching practices. And in 2015, resource staff had several communities of practices, including counties from around the state centered around the power of looking at contract language to support implementation of evidence-based practices. We are currently reviewing county provider contract language in our ongoing monitoring um, activities <clears throat> to support the idea of adding additional coaching as an expectation to um, in their contracts when they're reaching out um, to their contract providers. Stakeholder input during the phase two of our state systemic improvement plan really helped inform Wisconsin that there was maybe an additional need and that was to be able to measure and evaluate the statewide implementation of evidence-based practices and the effectiveness of coaching practices across system. So our this slide is really kind of talking about where we're going um, in the future around coaching practices. We really want to do the plan, do, study, act cycle to really again talk about our mo monitoring and general supervision. So we wanted to bring that measurement into this cycle. And so what we're working on, as Dana kind of alluded to earlier, was this idea of a benchmark tool that will be developed by the Department of Health Services that will establish for counties a way for them to put into place for coaching to occur at every level. During our monitoring of the counties, will they be required to produce evidence that at a local system level and a child level system, implementation of evidence-based practices of coaching has occurred. Our then resource facilitators will continue to support the counties after the benchmark has been completed so that external coaching 
to contribute to that plan do study act will be a key component in having that be successful. The additional benefit of the benchmark tool will be a source of data for us at a state level to measure where we're at at implementing evidence-based practices. Then we can use that same data to inform our large professional development system across the state and our technical assistance system on where our focus needs to be and where we can support counties at their implementation. We're anticipating that the role of this benchmark tool will be targeted for January 2018. So as we roll out that benchmark tool, we really believe that we'll have a better connection between our state and our county systems and then also between our contract with resources, our technical assistance, to really help assure high quality early intervention across Wisconsin. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Dana. It's encouraging to learn about your process, how you've supported your regional resource technical assistance personnel and county-based providers. And thank you for sharing the plans you have to continue your journey for statewide implementation of the primary coach approach to teaming. We'll now hear from Hope Beisel and Sally Hansen from Minnesota. They're both professional development facilitators who support coaching related to the pyramid model. As a reminder, listeners, please note your questions, reactions, and experiences related to supporting coaching for practice change and statewide systems change. Hope, thank you for starting us out. Great. Thanks, Mary. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your interest in learning about how the Minnesota Centers of Excellence supports coaching in its innovation work. My name is Hope Beisel, and I will be, will be joined by my colleague Sally Hansen in a few minutes. Sally and I are both early childhood special education professional development facilitators with the Minnesota Centers of Excellence. The Minnesota Centers of Excellence was started in 2010 in an effort to create a cross-sector system of professional development for early childhood educators. This cross-sector system includes, but is not limited, to birth to three early, early intervention providers, Head Start, local child development centers, and general ed programs such as early childhood family education, voluntary pre-K, and school readiness. The Centers of Excellence has chosen to formally embed practice-based coaching into three innovations that we currently support, the pyramid model, family-guided routines-based intervention, and the classroom engagement model. Please feel free to visit our website at www.mncoe.org to learn more about these innovations. In addition to this innovation work, the Centers of Excellence also supports additional work around foundational skills in early childhood settings. The Centers of Excellence exist in 11 regions throughout the state of Minnesota, covering all educational districts. Each region has at least one Early Childhood Special Education Professional Development Facilitator, PDF, who also serves as the external coach to innovation work. External coaches are employed through the Centers of Excellence to support local programs in a variety of ways, one of which is using implementation science and practice-based coaching to install, implement, and scale up evidence-based practices around the three innovations mentioned earlier. External coaches directly support internal coaches within school districts and their community partners to help practitioners in adopting evidence-based practices. We will talk more about each of these roles in a couple of slides. During this next school year, the Minnesota Centers of Excellence will be supporting 30 sites in installing an innovation. The Minnesota Centers of Excellence is funded through Part B and Part C dollars flowing through the Minnesota Department of Education, MDE. MDE provides leadership and technical assistance as well as directs the work of the Centers of Excellence. State level early childhood special education, ECSC, support has been critical in the development and fiscal supports that create the centers of excellence. The state office is working across divisions to ensure that the work of the centers of excellence with regard to ECSC professionals has an impact on all sectors serving young children with disabilities. MTE also provides dollars on a decelerating basis to local implementation sites to help programs install an innovation using implementation science. 
Many programs use a portion of these dollars to help scale up and sustain coaching efforts at the site level. The Minnesota Centers of Excellence has a state leadership team comprised of state agency staff, professional development facilitators, and community partners representing higher education and parent advocacy groups. We continue to work toward increased collaboration with additional community partners as our state leadership team has recently been re-envisioned. Our team meets monthly and uses the state level benchmarks of quality to guide our work. Each of our three innovations supported through the Centers of Excellence also has a cross-sector innovation specific leadership team that meets on a monthly basis to provide additional support and guidance in scaling up evidence-based practices in Minnesota. Although not specifically called out in Minnesota's State Systemic Improvement Plan, CISIP, our CISIP repeatedly makes reference to the use of implementation frameworks, such as practice-based coaching and the use of evidence-based practices. Therefore, practice-based coaching is the vehicle that we use to deliver and support the needed coaching structure for local program implementation. The world's best workforce bill was passed in 2013 to ensure every school district in the state is making strides to increase student performance. Each district must develop a plan that addresses the five goals listed on the slide. We believe that the work we are doing through the Centers of Excellence to support local practitioners with evidence-based practices has direct impact on the first three goals listed on the slide. Minnesota has been embedding coaching into its innovation work since 2010. Starting in 2010, we had external coaches who were referred to as master cadre trainers who provided both innovation specific training and coaching to sites implementing an innovation. Master cadre trainers would assist internal coaches in completing two observations per year, which then helped determine what ongoing efforts would be focused on between internal coaches and practitioners on an ongoing basis. Internal coaches are program staff who are employed at the innovation site, and part of their role is dedicating time to coach practitioners who are implementing the innovation. Master cadre trainers would check in with internal coaches on a periodic basis to see if any additional supports around coaching were needed. Master cadre members were not provided with specific training or support around their role as a coach outside of webinar, webinar opportunities that were targeted to the internal coaching role. The Minnesota Centers of Excellence introduced our new way of coaching supports starting in 2015, practice-based coaching. For those programs who had already been installing an innovation at this time, they were asked to adopt practice-based coaching as their coaching framework, while it is now a formal expectation for any new innovation sites. During this time of transition, we differentiated the trainer role and the external coaching role. Former master cadre trainers maintained their training role, but no longer provided external coaching. The external coaching role became part of the ongoing support that professional development facilitators provide to innovation sites. The coaching role is now a more intensive role as professional development facilitators are more actively involved with internal coaches on a monthly basis. In addition to the ongoing support of the professional development facilitator, all internal coaches go through practice-based coaching training as soon as they begin their role as an internal coach. In June of 2015, Denise Binder from the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center partnered with us to, del to deliver our first practice-based coaching training in Minnesota. This training was based on the framework of practice-based coaching developed through the Office of Head Start. Internal coaches from innovation sites, professional development facilitators, and five future practice-based coaching trainers were invited to participate in this training event. During the rest of that school year, additional coaching webinars were made available to that same audience in an effort to provide ongoing support around this new way of coaching. As this formalized process of practice-based coaching was now an expectation. The Minnesota Centers of Excellence now offers a one-day practice-based coaching training annually in three regions in Minnesota. 
This training is provided by five practice-based coaching trainers. Practice-based coaching trainers receive ongoing support through the Minnesota Centers of Excellence prior to, during, and after training events. And these trainers also participate in an annual Train the Trainer Day. In addition to the formal one-day practice-based coaching training, the Minnesota Centers of Excellence also host three live practice-based coaching webinars each year to support coaches of each innovation. These webinars are also recorded so that those who are not able to participate live can still gain access to the information and or choose to use the recorded webinar as a support strategy for their team. In addition to these live webinars, separate pre-recorded webinars have been created for each component of the practice-based coaching cycle, focused observations, reflection and feedback, and shared goals and action planning. These pre-recorded webinars are available for internal coaches to access at any time throughout the year when they feel they need additional support or a refresher on the content of that specific cycle of practice-based coaching. Some internal coaches choose to access these recorded webinars individually. Some ask for the support of their external coach in viewing and processing the webinar together and some groups of internal coaches access the recorded webinars to view and process as a group. Sally Hansen is now going to join us to talk a little bit more about what coaching looks like at the site level here in Minnesota. Okay, so I uh, thank you, Hope, for the introduction. And I want to talk a little bit next about a critical piece of coaching in Minnesota, which includes discussions about the stages and drivers of implementation science. Starting during the exploration stage, external coaches begin conversations about the selection of the internal coaches. We help the local implementation team members think about who in their program has the time, knowledge, interest, and characteristics to be a successful internal coach. Then we offer live training and recorded webinars to the internal coaches to make sure they have consistent knowledge and understanding of the practice-based coaching framework. Once the internal coaches get started, then the external coaches provide them with coaching and support. For example, external coaches might help do a focused observation or support a coach with writing goals and action steps. External coaches are also available to help internal coaches reflect on their practice. During implementation team meetings, external coaches help guide discussions about sustaining and scaling up the program's coaching. They might review how much time is being spent in coaching, what's going well, what supports are needed, and talk about the capacity of the current coach or coaches. Finally, external coaches support teams in using data to understand the implementation and effectiveness of coaching in their program. We will look at the data elements in an upcoming slide. At the state level, our team is working to scale up and sustain our practice-based coaching trainers. We're in the process of working with our partners at the University of Minnesota to develop an application process for folks interested in becoming trainers. The state implementation team also reviews the practice-based coaching training, materials, activities uh, to determine if we need more information about a particular piece of the framework, um, the specific strategies, or more opportunities for practice. And lastly, the state implementation team works to provide guidance on systems level information that will support the local program's coaching work. For example, in the past, we've provided teams with descriptions of the roles and responsibilities a coach might be expected to fulfill. More recently, the state implementation team created guidance around the frequency and duration of coaching that they should be providing a practitioner. Um, that is included on the next slide. So the state implementation team created this coaching and fidelity document to help programs plan for the amount and frequency of coaching to provide. The plan is meant to guide programs to provide enough coaching to make a difference in the practitioner's use of the innovation, and then adjust the amount of coaching as they demonstrate using the skills. In the beginning phase, we recommend having an internal coach go through two practice-based coaching cycles each month with the practitioner they are coaching. Once the practitioner demonstrates 80% of the practices in each key area of the observation tool, they move to the next expanding phase. At that time, teams might conserve coaching resources and decrease coaching to once per month 
until the practitioner is able to demonstrate 80% of practices in each key element a second time. After a practitioner has shown mastery of the practices a second time, then those folks will move into the maintaining phase. Internal coaches will complete the observation tool every other year and provide coaching as needed. This plan is newly released this year. The state implementation team hopes that it will help local programs make decisions about how to best use their coaching resources. So how do we know if the things we have in place are working? As I mentioned before, we are dedicated to using data to evaluate our work around coaching. Across the state, we provide programs with several data collection tools and information about how to use them. External coaches support data collection and analysis at the program level. Coaching logs are completed by internal coaches after every observation and meeting. They're compiled at the program level into an Excel spreadsheet that generates charts and graphs so teams understand how much time is spent in coaching and which strategies are being used and not used. These are reviewed by the local implementation teams and can be used when an external coach supports the internal coach. Implementation teams can also look at coaching action plans and the benchmarks of quality to understand what's going well with coaching and what needs improvement. Finally, external coaches can use the information from training surveys to make sure all coaches understand the key elements of the practice-based coaching cycle and follow up with them if needed. The state implementation team also uses data. The team collects program data twice a year, including programs, coaching logs, observation tools, and benchmarks of quality. The state implementation team reviews the data to look for patterns in the frequency and duration of coaching, the strategies folks are and are not using, trends in the benchmarks of quality around coaching plans, and so on. The state team also reviews survey data from folks who attend practice-based coaching training and surveys from the trainers to see if there are areas of training that can be improved. Finally, the team, the state team, gathers feedback from external coaches about what's working in programs and where the gaps exist. So what's next for coaching in Minnesota? We feel as though we've come a long way with our coaching framework in Minnesota, but we still have a lot of work to do. So here's the next big items on our to-do list. Number one, we plan to create formal guidance for teams about the selection of internal coaches based on factors including skills and experience. Number two, each year it's important to us to add resources based on new research and best practices in the field. This year, we are working to add resources from the National Training Institute for Challenging Behavior, such as self-reflection checklists for internal coaches and information on group coaching. Number three, we are excited to create a more systematic approach to external coaching support. For example, we plan to create a consistent monthly guidance for external coaches to use with the internal coaches they support. Number four, our team is continuing to explore options for supporting internal coaches, such as networking groups, reflective practice opportunities, um, internal coaches participating in group coaching regionally, and thinking about virtual options. Finally, we believe it is important to gather feedback from practitioners and internal coaches about their experiences. So we will be looking for ways to create uh, that opportunity across the state. Thank you, Sally. We trust that the information you and Hope have shared from your work in Minnesota is an inspiration for others in their statewide coaching for practice change efforts. Our goal today was to learn more about what is foundational to a healthy state infrastructure for coaching that supports practice change. We've asked the presenters from Wisconsin and Minnesota to share a little bit more about their lessons learned. What has made all the difference for your state regarding implementation of this work? Terry? Well, I'll, I'll let Terry, and hopefully she's going to talk about implementation science, because I, I think that was that was a huge aha moment in which we had had that <laughs> four or five years ago. And I, I think I would co concur that the use of using implementation science to help guide our work and to organize it in our state has really been a way for us to build a system that's sustainable. I think we're going to 
move away from the hit and miss of what we had done before, because I think we're thinking smarter about our system, because um, that framework then really helps us establish the support that we need to do around policy, also about what we need to do about our monitoring, and really specifically around our technical assistance system that we need to do. So I think that's been our aha moment mm -hmm. um, in this work, and I think that I'm very helpful that we'll be able to move forward using implementation science. Yeah. And it's being introduced, um, our resource staff constantly reference back to uh, the three drivers when they're working with counties, when they seem to be stuck or they can't move forward or there seems to be an issue with uh, whatever it is they're trying to implement, they always say, we're going to run it through the drivers. And they really are able to identify things that are working and not working in each one of those uh, pieces or each one of those drivers. And Hope and Sally, what has made all the difference for you? So for us, uh, it's sort of two things. And I'll start by saying one is having consistent formal training available across the state to our internal coaches. We were fortunate to have Denise Binder bring the practice-based coaching training to Minnesota as part of our work with the ECTA. And we've been able to sustain that effort here and provide consistent formal training to all of our internal coaches. That's been really helpful. And I think one of the other things that Sally and I both agree has made a really big difference is the role of the professional development facilitators meeting that, in, that external coaching role. Um, the external coaches, we are able to collaborate on a very regular basis together to make sure that we're approaching our coaching role in a, in a consistent manner. And really the amount of time that we're able to dedicate to the innovation sites is quite a bit of time. It really varies based on the needs of a site. But we as external coaches are often out with our implementation sites several times a month, either working with the administrators, um, but directly working with the internal coaches and supporting their role. Um, so really having designated external coaches who have quite a bit of time to support implementation sites has made a world of difference for us here in Minnesota. We're also curious about the next steps. Terry, what's most pressing for the state of Wisconsin? I think that um, what's more the most pressing thing that we are uh, embarking on currently is the idea of using a benchmark tool um, to measure and show evidence of implementation of evidence-based practices um, focused around primary coach approach to teaming. Um, I think using the idea of implementation science, our benchmark tool will be complementary to look at across systems. So we're looking really at measuring what the counties have in place to make sure that evidence-based practices are occurring and that there's high quality early intervention happening for children and families that live in their counties. The benchmark tool at first, um, when we st started doing that work, was looking at more at a implementation of that early intervention skills, but we really needed to step backwards and say, what we need to measure is the state of the systems that the counties have in place. We will then expect the counties to be able to measure how their early interventionists are delivering evidence-based practices. So that work is um, moving along quickly. Um, but very intentionally making sure that we have the right questions and we find the right evidence that we can say that that truly is occurring in that county. Um, we will continue to use the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle to when we roll out the benchmark <coughs> tool to say, is this the evidence that we thought was there and can it be um, cross fidelity across the, the counties and what do we need to adjust as we do the next part? So that plan to study act is gonna be a big part of the benchmark tool. I'll, I'll add on, it's probably no secret uh, in Wisconsin that depending on which county you go to, there's gonna be different versions of evidence-based practices. And that is one uh, component that we really wanna take a look at because ultimately as OSEP made very clear that they want to be able to go to the northern, the southern, uh, the northeast, and whatever birth to three program they 
walk into, uh, it, they're going to see similar, if not uh, the same type of service services being implemented. Yeah, I agree that in every state system, uh, depending on how you operationalize it, um, Wisconsin has 72 local opera operationalized programs. And so creating a tool that will be able to measure that at that 72 county level um, is going to be important to speak to statewide implementation. We are out of time for our session. Thank you to each of our presenters for sharing the information. And thank you to each of our presenters participants for joining us for this part one of the Learning Lab Statewide Implementation Systems Considerations and Examples. We will reconvene on June 19th from 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern for part two of this topic. Meanwhile, we will be asking you for your questions and comments via the survey link you'll soon receive. We will compile the themes from your questions and comments and ask our presenters to return on June 19th to address these topics. The format of the June 19th Learning Lab will be that of a question and answer session. Until next time, thank you.